Hi students, this is a review of chapter 14, um, or the renal system. So we're going to be talking about the basic principles of renal physiology, and then into the details of the regulation of ion and water balance, and we'll talk as well about some of the hydrogen ion regulation and acidosis and alkalosis. So this is a review of the urinary system, just the parts really quick. We've got the kidneys and the ureters, which are bilateral. There's a single bladder and a single urethra. The kidneys are the factories that produce urine, while everything else is are basically just tubes in order to um, transfer transport that urine um, to the bladder where it is stored for a while and then um, when it's when we're ready, we're going to urinate that urine through the urethra. So basically, you know, the most of the action, if not all of the action, is really happening in the kidneys. Um, as soon as it reaches these other um, organs, there's really nothing at all that is being changed in that urine. So we already talked about the ureters; those transport urine from the kidneys to the bladder, and then the bladder will store urine until. Um, we're ready for micturition, which is urination, and then the urethra is going to carry the urine from the bladder to the outside of the body. So what are the functions of kidney? We always think of the kidney kind of like, you know, that urine making um, factory, which is true, but it has other functions. So um, it is in the process of making urine, we are regulating our water and ion balance. So you'll see that there's a lot of um, um, sodium and potassium and hydrogen ions, um, so again tying into this acid-base balance that is occurring and we're always, we're constantly changing the composition of urine according to the needs of the body. This acid-base balance occurs, is kind of like a dual function between the kidneys and the lungs and we'll talk about that, you know, more when we get to um, acidosis and alkalosis. It helps, the kidneys help us get rid of the metabolic waste products, for example, urea and uric acid. And it considers um, too much potassium is also considered a waste product. Too much hydrogen are considered, and bicarbonate are considered waste products. So these are other things, you know, that the kidney would get rid of. It also helps in removing some foreign chemicals. So for example, some of the medications that we take are going to eventually be excreted out of the body through the kidneys. It does help a little bit in gluconeogenesis, although the main organ for that process is the liver. The kidney produces it at a smaller degree. And then there are some hormones that are made by the kidney. So again, we really don't think of the kidney as an endocrine gland, um, but it does have some endocrine function. So for instance, it releases erythropoietin, which is the hormone that stimulates the production of red blood cells by the bone marrow. It also makes renin, and that is an enzyme that is um, has a, a very important role in blood pressure and sodium balance. And it also converts um, this inactive vitamin D to its active form, 125-dihydroxy um, vitamin D, and that has a role in calcium um, balance. So the major structural components of the kidney. So we'll take a look at the gross picture, which is, you know, the, by the naked eye, what do we see? There's a capsule on the outside, and that's a fibrous capsule. That fibrous capsule is surrounded by lots of fat. We don't see the fat here in the picture, but there is a lot of perirenal fat that has to be removed in order to take a look at, to find the capsule. Um, underneath the capsule, we have this cortex. And then underneath the cortex, there is the medulla of the kidney, and the medulla is made of these little pyramids. And in between the pyramids, we have these columns. As the, we'll talk about the, the you know, the pipes, those very microscopic pipes that we call tubules where urine is actually being made. Those are going to eventually dump all of that urine into these spaces. That space is known as a minor calyx, and then these two minor calyces gather together to make a bigger calyx known as the major calyx. And then you'll have a um, funnel-shaped part known as the um, pelvis of the ureter. And then the urine will go down the ureter in order to reach the urinary bladder. 
Okay, lots of the pipes, so what we term, what we call tubules, are found in the cortex and in the medulla as well. Okay, this is considered the hilum of the kidney, and again, the hilum of any organ is where things go in or out of the organ. So you'll see here the renal artery is entering while the renal vein is exiting, and the um, ureter is exiting too. So what is the nephron? The nephron is the structural and functional unit of the kidney. So in order for a healthy kidney to function, you need millions of these nephrons. Okay, so again, your building blocks, um, whether we're talking structure-wise or function-wise of the kidney are known as a is known as a nephron. And the nephron is made out of a renal corpuscle, okay? And the renal corpuscle is attached to a series of tubules that eventually, and this is how, you know, in the renal corpuscle, we're going to start urine formation through a process known as filtration. And then in these tubules, whatever is filtered is now known as filtrate. We are going to change the composition of that filtrate throughout these tubules until we eventually reach the minor, uh, the uh, collecting ducts and the minor calyx. Once we reach the minor calyx, nothing is going to change in the composition of that filtrate. So that corpuscle is made out of a little capsule known as Bowman's capsule. And inside of that capsule, there is a tuft of capillaries or a um, group of capillaries. And those are known as the glomerular capillaries. And that again is where filtration happens. So I'm gonna go to the picture first to, I'll come back, I promise, for this renal corpuscle where we have that Bowman's capsule made out of a very thin layer of flat epithelium and then this right here these represent that um, tuft of capillaries that are on the inside you could see that blood vessel known as the afferent or the afferent arteriole that would be the blood going in and then the blood circulates through these capillaries and exits through the afferent with an e um, a couple of important things to keep in mind that first off, the afferent arterial is wider than the efferent, meaning that more blood is going in um, and less blood is exiting. That keeps the pressure inside of these capillaries high enough in order to help with the filtration process. So that high hydrostatic pressure is needed for filtration to occur. You can also see that these capillaries look pink because they are covered by these cells known as podocytes. And they have literally these feet-like projections. In between the projections, you'll see these little slits known as those filtration pores. And that is how filtration is going to occur. So this right here is your capillary. You see the red blood cell there. Okay, and the capillaries have their own pores. And then these are the um, podocytes of that cell. So in order for anything to filter out, it has to be small enough to fit through these little tiny pores. So the, the parts of blood that can fit through and are filtered would be plasma with, so basically water, with the ions, the sodium chloride, potassium, hydrogen, bicarb. You also have some vitamins, urea, uric acid, creatinine, some fatty acid, but things that are big cannot pass through. So you see this red blood cell is too big to pass through. So you are not going to find red blood cells um, in urine unless there is an abnormality. Other things that cannot pass through, white blood cells, for example, are too big. So again, depending on the size of cells, the smaller ones are going to pass through, bigger ones are prevented because of their size. So you'll find maybe amino acids, but definitely proteins that are too big are not going to be find it, found in urine. Okay, so that is the renal corpuscle portion of this. And I wanna go back to kind of take a look at the whole structure of the nephron. So we already talked about the structure of, the, um, of this corpuscle, but then we said that the corpuscle is attached to a whole, um, a series of tubules. We call this first mess, we call that the proximal convoluted tubule. And then we reach the nephron loop or the loop of Henle, H-E-N-L-E. There's the descending limb 
that is much thinner than the ascending limb. So you see the ascending limb is a little bit thicker in portions at least. And then that takes us to these waves and those are known as your distal convoluted tubules. For sure, you can just call them proximal and distal tubules for, you know, to make things easier. From that distal tubule, that will go to the collecting duct, and then from the collecting duct to the minor calyx and so on. So that is the pathway of the nephron. Um, again, the nephron ends at the distal tubule, so the collecting duct is not part of the nephron. This again is your structural and functional unit of the kidney. You need millions of these that are healthy in order for um, urine to be made. We said that urine formation starts off with filtration that helps, that starts right here, that occurs in this portion, while things are going to be changed to that filtrate. So the fluid that is passing through these tubules is now called filtrate. We are going to change, make changes to it. So we might reabsorb things back into the blood or secrete things into that filtrate. And whatever is made at the end of the distal tubules is now considered urine. Okay, so we talked about the basic structure and function, but we did not talk about the blood vessels. So there's a huge blood supply, um, you know, related to these nephrons. So we have capillaries that are related to the corpuscle, and we talked about that already. So we talked about the glomerular capillaries. We talked about the um, afferent and the efferent. Um, so there, this is your afferent and this is your efferent um, capillaries. And this glomerulus capillary is one of the examples where usually um, capillaries connect an arterial to, to a venule, but that is not the case in these glomerular capillaries. These capillaries connect an arterial to another arterial. So you want to kind of keep that in mind. We'll get to that later um, in, in this chapter. So, and how do I know that this is the afferent and this is the efferent? Because this is thicker wider in diameter than this one. Okay, now for the rest of the um, blood supply, we have what are known as the peritubular capillaries. So this, all of these capillaries that are surrounding the proximal and the distal tubules are known as the peritubular capillaries. Notice that I skipped the nephron loop, okay? The, nef the blood vessels surrounding the nephron loop are known as the vasa recta, okay? So, um, now we also, you know, every, when everything is done, so let's kind of follow the pathway of urine and how is it going to um, pass through these different tubules. So the filtration is going to happen here in the um, glomerulus, and then it'll pass through the proximal convoluted tubules, then the descending limb, ascending limb, proximal, sorry, distal convoluted tubules, and then to the collecting duct. When it reaches the collecting duct, um, it will go into, I guess I have to go backwards then, after the collecting duct it will go into the minor, minor calyx, then major calyx, then the renal pelvis, which is that funnel-shaped area, and then the ureter down to the bladder, and then the urethra, and then to the outside of the body. So you want to be familiar with that pathway um, very common thing to be asked about. So you have your renal corpuscle made out of the, the capillaries and the Bowman's capsule surrounding it. And then you have your renal, um, these tubules. Okay, remember the proximal that leads to the loop of Henle and that leads to your distal tubule and this is where the nephron ends. Then you have your collecting system which is made out of the cortical and the medullary collecting ducts and then the, down to the um, minor, major, calyces, and then the renal pelvis. To understand what a cortical and medullary collecting duct is, this up here is the cortex of the kidney, and this cortical collecting duct, or this part of the collecting duct is found in the cortex, while this part of the collecting duct is found in the medulla or um, in those pyramids that we've talked about. Now for the renal corpuscle, we already, you know, kind of discussed the different parts we said that the renal corpuscle is made out of that Bowman's capsule that um, is made out of that one layer of um, cells. And then the capillaries on the inside are surrounded by pot potocytes that have these finger-like projections. 
And in between those projections, there are little spaces or slits or filtrations, and that helps. Um, that This is how different things are going to be filtered in. Okay, so um, I'm going to kind of move on since we already discussed that portion. So the capillaries that are associated with the nephrons, which is something that we discussed already as well, that we have two different sets of capillaries. There are the glomerular capillaries and the peritubular ones. So the glomerular capillary, that is the capillary that is found inside of the glomerulus, and it connects the afferent to the afferent arteriole. Um, again, the, glomer the afferent arteriole is wider in diameter than the efferent, so you have more blood going into these capillaries than leaving it. And that high hydrostatic pressure is what helps glomerular filtration rates. Okay, um, The peritubular capillaries are the capillaries that are surrounding the tubules, proximal and distal. The ones that surround the nephron loop is are known as the vasorecta. We talked about, um, so now that we know the whole nephron, the majority of the nephron, so about 85% of these nephrons are found in the cortex, and we call those cortical nephrons. They might not have a loop at all, or their loop are very short, okay, and they do not contribute to the hypertonic medullary interstitium. So in order to understand what that is, I am going to go back to this picture right here. It is um, the medulla has to have a hypertonic um, interstitium, meaning the interstitial tissue in that area needs to be hypertonic. The cortical nephrons do not contribute to that process. The ones that do contribute to that would be the juxtamedullary nephrons. Um, what does this hypertonic medullary interstitium do? We'll talk about that later on. Um, so. But again, the cortical nephrons don't really contribute to this issue, to the um, to it. The juxtamedullary nephrons, those are the nephrons that are close to the medulla, so deeper in the cortex. Juxta means neighboring or close by. These have long loops of Henle, and these are responsible for um, the hypertonic medullary interstitium, and they regulate the amount of water that we are eventually going to be um, excreting in urine or reabsorbing and keeping in our body. Okay, only 15% of the nephrons um, are found under this category. Okay. So the juxtaglomerular nephrons have a very important apparatus known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. These, This apparatus is made by or has different cells. Okay, So the different cells, we kind of introduced them. We have the juxtaglomerular cells and when those are stimulated, um, they, usually they are stretched, okay? When there is a decrease in blood pressure, so that leads to a decrease in stretch of these cells, these cells are going to start releasing renin. Okay, so renin is made by the juxtaglomerular cells that are found in this apparatus. We have other cells, and those are known as your macula densa. Macula densa are a part of, these are very specialized cells that are found in the ascending limb as it curves to become the distal convoluted tubule. And these macula densa cells detect changes in the osmolality of the filtrate or changes in the sodium chloride content of the filtrate. And therefore they help in the regulation of sodium balance and hence blood pressure. So let's take a look at that apparatus. Okay, so the apparatus is made um, as the ascending limb curves to make, to become the distal tubule. So we have these macula densa cells. Those have osmoreceptors or osmotic receptors and that indicate, or those detect changes in the osmolality of the filtrate. Okay, while these um, juxtaglomerular cells, these are cells that are found they are surrounding the afferent arteriole, and those detect changes in pressure. They have baroreceptors, and they are stimulated. Um, they release renin when blood pressure goes down. Okay, so these are stretch receptors that are basically stimulated with the decrease in blood pressure 
um, where we have lost that stretch. So decrease in blood pressure is going to release renin from these cells. And this area right here, all of these cells that we've talked about, those are known collectively as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now we'll talk about the process of making urine. So making urine has three different steps. First step is filtration. Okay, so in order to understand what we're looking at here, this is your afferent arteriole, this is the efferent arteriole, and this represents Bowman space and then the tubules. So the first step of making urine would be filtration. Okay, so things are going to be filtered out into Bowman's capsule and we are now going to call that liquid or that fluid, we are gonna call it filtrate. And then as the filtrate passes through the different tubules, a couple of things are going to happen. Um, we have the first thing to happen is um, secretion, okay? Tubular secretion means that some things that are still found in my peritubular capillaries, so still found in my blood, are considered waste products and I want to get rid of it. So I'm going to secrete these waste products from the capillaries into the tubule and we call that tubular secretion. Examples of these would be excess potassium, excess hydrogen ions. Um, maybe I can secrete different drugs or medications that I was taking and I want to get rid of them. So again, your tubular secretion is where things, these are considered waste products your body wants to get rid of. So it'll, the direction of flow would be from the peritubular capillary into the tubule. The third process would be reabsorption. Okay, so this is something that is, has, been, has been filtered into the filtrate, but my body needs it. So we talked about filtration. We said that anything that is small enough can pass through. And that included all of our glucose, all of our amino acids, all of our sodium, but the, our body needs those. So there is, and we are going to reabsorb it in order to keep them into the body. So tubular reabsorption, is the passage of important substances from the tubules into the peritubular capillaries. Okay, so this is again things that our body needs and wants to keep. Anything else that is left, okay, so if you do the math, you know, the amount that was filtered, add the things that were secreted, subtract the things that you reabsorbed, whatever is left is what you are going to eventually excrete as urine. So these are just different numbers to kind of take a look, um, you know, understand how these different things um, ha happen, okay? So we filter every day about 180 liters of water. It's not that we have 180 liters per water of water in our body, it's just that the kidneys filter um, our blood several times a day, okay? So every day, our nephrons filter about 180 liters per water. We obviously do not end up making 180 liters of urine. Okay, so the amount of urine we make on average is about 1.8. Um, so we are going to reabsorb 99% of that water. Okay, another example would be glucose. We filter all of our glucose in the filtration, in the filtrate, but we do not excrete glucose, okay, unless you um, unless the patient is diabetic, but under normal conditions, no glucose is present in urine, which means that we have to reabsorb 100% of that glucose, okay? So hopefully you kind of understand how this process happens. Um, kidneys filter anything depending on size, and then it goes back and adjusts the composition of that filtrate. So glomerular filtration, again, is a bulk flow, okay, a passive flow of everything that can fit through those little pores. Okay, the um, bigger plasma proteins, for example, cannot filter through your red blood cells, white blood cells, and so on are too big. The glomeruli in the kidney are very efficient filters. Okay, they can filter about 180 liters per day. And um, there's a lot of different pressures that are helping Actually, there's one pressure that is helping filtration and two pressures that oppose filtration. So let's talk about these different pressures um, in, uh, in the next slide. 
and just understand what would happen if we find things in urine that should not be there. So for instance, if blood starts to appear in urine, that is a process known as hematuria, or protein starts to appear, or proteinuria, that is going, that is, these are red flags that there's something wrong with the glomerular filtration barrier. Okay, blood cells are too big, proteins are too big, they should not be present in urine. And now that they are able to go through those filters, that means there's something wrong with that filter. Okay, um, so we'll talk about now the different forces that play, have a role in filtration. Whenever we talk about for forces, we honestly have only two things in our body. We either have hydrostatic pressure or osmotic pressure. Okay, if the osmotic pressure is due to plasma proteins, we are going to um, name it oncotic pressure. And these are the two pressures that we're going to be talking about, either hydrostatic or osmotic. Okay, so we have our Bowman space, okay, the, the space that has the capillaries, and this is the glomerular capillary. Okay, so this is the capsule. Um, now the afferent, the blood is going from the afferent going into this little tuft of capillaries. Because of the hydrostatic pressure of these capillaries, okay, that is going to push and help in the filtration process. Okay, so the hydrostatic pressure of the capillaries assists or helps in filtration, favors filtration. And that is the only pressure that favors filtration. So the filtration process is favored by the glomerular capillary blood pressure or hydrostatic pressure. But there are two forces that oppose filtration. Um, one of them is that Bowman space has water as well, which means it has its own hydrostatic pressure. So the hydrostatic pressure of Bowman's capsule is, um, which is this pressure right here, opposes filtration. Okay? While another pressure that opposes filtration is the plasma proteins that are trapped inside the capillaries, those by osmosis want to pull water as well. So that is another um, force that is opposing filtration. So in, um, you know, in short, you have one pressure that helps filtration and that is the hydrostatic pressure of the capillaries, while the other two pressures in play, which are the osmotic pressure of the capillary and the hydrostatic pressure of Bowman space, um, those oppose filtration. You don't have to worry about the numbers, but you do want to make sure that you're comfortable with which forces help filtration, which force, I should say, and which two forces oppose filtration. At the end, if you do the math, um, you know, the net uh, product of all of these forces helps in the filtration process. So your net result in the glomerulus is going to be filtration. Now the glomerular filtration rate is the volume of fluid filtered from the capillaries into Bowman space per unit time. So whenever you talk about rates, you wanna find out, um, you know, it is always going to be per unit time. It is determined by the NELT filtration pressure, but also by the permeability of the uh, membrane. Okay, so in other words, that glomerular filtration is directly proportional to the membrane permeability. So the more permeable um, the capillaries are, the higher or the faster the glomerular filtration rate would be. So we'll take a look at different scenarios and um, where this right here is represents your afferent arterial and this represents your afferent arterial. And this right here represents Bowman's capsule. So under normal conditions, we have said that the afferent arterial, which is not on this slide, but we said that the afferent arterial is wider, allows more blood to go in um, than the afferent. Okay, that higher hydrostatic pressure helps filtration. So what are different scenarios, like medications maybe that we're taking? If, um, and you wanna be comfortable with these different scenarios. So there is a constriction of the afferent arterial. That means the amount of blood going in, okay, is going to be less. 
Okay, that is going to decrease the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries, which will eventually decrease the glomerular filtration rates. Um, another way to decrease glomerular filtration would be to dilate the efferent. So now you have blood going in, but more blood is leaving. So that is also going to decrease the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries, leading to the decrease in glomerular filtration rate. So any scenario that decreases the hydrostatic pressure in the, glomer in the capillaries will decrease the GFR. If you want to increase the GFR, you have to think of a scenario that increases hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries. So for example, you can either constrict the efferent or dilate the afferent arterioles. Now for the division and labor in the tubules. So we talked a lot about, you know, what happens in the corpuscle. So what happens now in the rest of the tubules? Um, and what do we mean by the division of labor? So meaning that each part of the tubule has its own function. So we talked about filtration happening in the glomerulus. Um, uh, proximal convoluted tubules, that is mainly um, where the process of tubular reabsorption um, occurs, while the distal convoluted tubules is mainly where tubular secretion happens. So notice that I've said mainly, and you know, even the slides say the majority, because there is some overlap, but uh, by far the most reabsorption happens in the proximal tubules, while most of the secretion happens in the distal tubules. <coughs> So this is a diagrammatic, diagrammatic representation of the tubular epithelium. And um, we want to understand kind of like the reabsorption, I'm sorry, the reabsorption and how that occurs. So this is the filtrate or the tubule where the filtrate is passing. These are the epithelial cells of the tubules and these are the peritubular capillaries. So in, or any, for, in order for reabsorption to happen, <clears throat> again, these are things that are important to the body. We have to reabsorb it back um, into the capillaries so that we do not eventually lose it in urine. Anything that remains in the filtrate is eventually going to be excreted out. So that glucose that was filtered, those amino acids, um, <clears throat> you know, anything that is important to the body is going to be reabsorbed. So again, your reabsorption occurs in the direction from the tubules to the peritubular capillaries, <clears throat> excuse me, while secretion is in the opposite direction. Okay, there are two different ways where it can happen. Either um, um, some, you know, some of these, um, some of these things have to go through these tight junctions. Okay, um, that would be through paracellular transport, while others can just go through the cell, and that would be known as a transcellular transport. Some of them can be active, so they would need ATP, while other processes are passive, they do not need, need ATP. So tubular reabsorption of sodium, which is one of the most important things that the body, you know, filtered out, but we need it back. And sodium is the most abundant cation in the filtrate. And you'll see that a lot of the reabsorption process really depends on the reabsorption of sodium. So sodium reabsorption is an active process, okay, meaning that it needs ATP to happen. Um, and it happens throughout all of the tubules with the exception of the descending limb of the loop of Henle. So the descending limb is impermeable to sodium. It is actually impermeable to all of the ions, not just sodium. Okay, so you know, make sure that you keep that in mind because again, it's going to help us um, in the future. Okay, the pump that we use for sodium is usually the sodium potassium pump. Um, and um, when we are reabsorbing sodium, we sometimes, you know, different things kind of tag along with sodium and that would be a co-transport. So we can use the sodium um, to co-transport glucose with it or different amino acids as well. Okay. Now, when we co-transport glucose, okay, there is a relationship between the load or the amount of glucose in our plasma, which translate into how much glucose is filtered, and how does the kidney or how can the kidney respond and make sure that we re reabsorb all of it? Okay, so if a patient is non-diabetic, okay, the kidneys are able, their glucose levels are normal, the kidneys are able to reabsorb every single last glucose molecule. 
But in diabetic patients, especially if the diabetes is uncontrolled, they have hyperglycemia. So their blood glucose levels are higher than normal. That means that all of, if all of, when all of that glucose is filtered out into the filtrate, that is an overload on the kidney. Okay, and there is a limited number of transporters, of glucose transporters in the kidney. Um, so if these transporters are all saturated, okay, some glucose is going to eventually leak in urine and appear as glucosuria. Um, and the glucose, the presence of glucose in urine by osmosis is going to pull water with it as well. And that is why uncontrolled diabetic patients if their urine is analyzed, there is glucose in urine, and there's also um, um, polyuria, meaning that they urinate a lot because all of that glucose is always pulling water with it. Okay, so really the glucose presence or the appearance of glucose in urine is really dependent on the saturation of these glucose um, transporters. Okay, now for tubular secretion, and we said that most of that occur, happens in the distal tubules, so we are going to secrete things that are toxic to the body. So we any extra hydrogen, any extra potassium, okay, organic an anions that we don't need, we, we have to get rid of it, and secretion, we said, occurs in the direction of from capillary to tubule. So we are secrete, for example, drugs and drug metabolites, Okay, things that we don't need like urea and uric acid, removal of excess potassium and excess hydrogen um, ions in order to control and maintain a proper pH level. Now for the regulation of these transporters and channels. So what we have hormones and paracrine or autocrine factors that, you know, um, affect how these transporters and how these ion channels work. Do they work faster or do they work slower? Do I increase the reabsorption of sodium or do I decrease the reabsorption of sodium? All of these um, you know, decisions are made or kind of under the control of by these hormones and paracrine factors. Okay. Now, renal clearance means that if you or if a patient is given a certain substance, how long is it going to take for all of that substance to be completely removed and clear by the kidney per unit time. Okay, we usually, in a clinical setting, we usually use the clearance of creatinine, creatinine clearance. Okay, the only problem with that is that creatinine is filtered, but it is also secreted. Okay, so the amount of creatinine that appears in urine is not does not only depend on the glomerular filtration rate. A small amount of it does depend on secretion. That is why if you wanna get a more accurate um, picture of glomerular filtration rate, you would do what is known as the re renal clearance of inulin. Inulin is a synthetic product that is given to the patient and you wait until all of that is cleared and you use that to calculate the GFR. But if, you know, the for an initial kind of screening of GFR, creatinine clearance is a good uh, measure. You really don't want to expose patients to synthetic things that might have their own, you know, allergic reactions maybe too. So if you can avoid doing that. Now, micturition is just a fancy term for urination, which means that the bladder is going to, co to contract and release that urine to the outside of the body. There is a smooth muscle found in the bladder that is known as the detrusor muscle. The detrusor muscle is the muscle that will contract and squeeze the urine out. At the very um, base of the bladder, there are two um, sphincters. So the internal urethral sphincter, that is under um, that is also a smooth muscle. It's actually part of the detrusor muscle, okay, wrapped around the most proximal part of the urethra. And then distal to that, there is an external urethral sphincter, which is made out of skeletal muscle fibers. So that is the muscle that we control. When, 
we are potty training kids, we are training them to control that external urethral sphincter. Now, the external urethral sphincter, because it is a skeletal muscle fiber, so that is under the somatic the control of the somatic nervous system, while the detrusor and internal sphincters, those are smooth muscle fibers, so those are under the control of the autonomic nervous system. So we'll take a look here at the different muscles and the different controls. So the detrusor muscle, we said that is a smooth muscle fiber. It is innervated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember your parasympathetic is what helps you urinate. Okay, so if the parasympathetic, under parasympathetic stimulation, that is going to cause the contraction of the smooth muscle fiber. Okay, when we're when we're micturating or when we're urinating, you're going to stimulate the detrusor in between. So at, you know, when we're not urinating, when the bladder is being filled up with urine, um, we inhibit, the parasympathetic is going to inhibit that detrusor muscle. When we talk about the internal urethral sphincter, that's also a smooth muscle. This is under the sympathetic control though. Under normal conditions in, you know, when we're not emptying the bladder, the sympathetic is always stimulating that sphincter to contract. When we're ready to urinate, the sympathetic stops sending impulses to the internal sphincter and that sphincter relaxes. As for the external sphincter, that is a skeletal muscle fiber under the control of the somatic, um, the somatic nervous system, we are um, in between urinations, so when the bladder is being filled up with urine, we are, that is stimulated, okay? We keep that sphincter contracted, but during urination, um, we're going to stop or inhibit the impulses going to that sphincter so that sphincter relaxes and allows for passage of urine. Incontinence, that is the involuntary release of urine, um, and it is more common in women. So we're not talking about incontinence in kids. We're talking about incontinence of the terms of somebody that was able to control their urine and then they lost that control. Okay, so that, this is a very different topic. So incontinence is again the involuntary release of urine, which occurs more common in women due to, especially if there is repeated pregnancies and repeated deliveries that kind of um, affect some of these muscles. So the most common kind is known as stress incontinence, meaning that any increase in the intra-abdominal pressure like sneezing, coughing, or exercise is going to release some urine from the bladder. There's also urge incontinence, which means the increase the desire to urinate where the patient will tell you that I'm fine and then all of a sudden I feel this sudden urge that I have to empty my bladder. That is known as an urge incontinence. Some medications like estrogen replacement therapy are taken to improve vaginal tone. Um, the muscles of the um, pelvic floor, the external urethral sphincter is happens to be one of them. So when you improve that tone of those muscles, and generally speaking, that would also help improving the tone in the external urethral sphincter. Okay. Sometimes in severe conditions, there, there would be what is known as um, surgery would be required in order to support um, the vaginal wall. And if you go back and kind of take a look at the anatomy and the female reproductive system, the vaginal wall is very directly, um, is, is in a direct relationship with the wall of the urethra and the, that of the bladder. Any irritation of the bladder or urethra due to an infection, for example, bacterial infection can lead to that urge incontinence. So we can treat it by, you know, treat the infection, okay? Um, if it is not caused by an infection, you can also treat it by bladder relaxants like Detrol or Oxytrol. These are the most common ones being used. The only problem with this is that these are anticholinergic ones. So these are ones that are going to block the cholinergic receptors, which were the parasympathetic receptors. So they have, they do have their side effects. They could lead to blurred vision, they also lead to constipation and they lead to an increase of heart rate. Now, what are the basic renal processes for sodium and water? So we're gonna be talking about in this portion about the regulation of sodium and water reabsorption. 
We already mentioned that sodium reabsorption, for the most part, is an active process. It happens throughout the whole tubule, with the exception of the descending limb. So you really need to remember that one exception, okay? It's going to help a lot uh, by, um, in the understanding of different things. Um, so sodium can be reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, ascending limb, and distal tubule, okay? Um, but again, the descending limb is not an area where sodium or any other ion for that matter can be reabsorbed. Water reabsorption usually happens passively by osmosis. So when sodium is reabsorbed, it's going to pull water with it. There are areas, um, the water reabsorption occurs through these aquaporin channels. We have about nine different aquaporin channels. The ones that are found in the collecting ducts, though, have the ability to hide, okay? They are usually hidden, okay? So again, we're talking about the aquaporins and the collecting ducts. These aquaporins are usually hidden, and they do not um, present themselves unless there is a high level of antidiuretic hormone. So we'll take a look at the different mechanisms of sodium reabsorption. First off, in the proximal tubule, so I see here that sodium is being reabsorbed. Um, it's an active process because we do have the sodium-potassium pump that helps here. If you're not familiar with what we're looking at, so let's kind of break it down because we're going to be looking at this image for a couple of slides. So this is the lumen of the tubule. In this case, we're talking about the proximal tubule. And these are your tubular cells. These are the tight junctions between the cells. And in order for sodium to be reabsorbed, it has, <coughs> excuse me, it has to pass through that apical membrane first and then through this basolateral membrane. You'll find that at the basolateral membrane, um, the sodium is reabsorbed through the sodium-potassium pump, and that is why um, sodium reabsorption is always an active process. At the apical membrane, things are tend to be different from one area to another. So in the proximal tubule, sodium can help in the co-transport of different things. For example, the co-transport of glucose or the co-transport of amino acids. It can also help in counter-transport. So sodium will be reabsorbed in exchange of another um, hydrogen or uh, positive ion, which in this case would be hydrogen. So we see how they, you know, um, other molecules kind of use sodium um, either to be co-transported with it or to be counter-transported. Now, again, remember the descending limb does not allow for sodium reabsorption, so we skip that part. And now we move on to the ascending limb. Again, you'll see at the basolateral membrane where the sodium-potassium pump is used. Well, at the apical membrane, there is a co-transporter that transports a lot of things. It transports sodium, potassium, and two chloride ions, and that is where this transporter or co-transporter gets its name. So you see all of these will be co-transported into the cell and then the sodium is going to be again reabsorbed at the basolateral membrane through that sodium potassium pump. The potassium and chloride just go through their own channels. <clears throat> now in the cortical collecting ducts, okay, at again one more time at the basolateral membrane, just your sodium potassium pump, while at the apical membrane, Sodium has its own ion channel and it can go by diffusion while potassium can be secreted by diffusion in the opposite direction. These are two separate channels um, showing you the, um, you know, the simple diffusion of sodium through the apical membrane into the, um, into the cell. Now the coupling of water and sodium reabsorption. So again, we talked about how water usually is pulled by sodium um, in the process of osmosis. That is known as the bulk flow. Okay, so as you see here, sodium is kind of going into these cells and it pulls water by osmosis, either transcellular or through these tight junctions, and that water through bulk flow is going to be absorbed into the peritubular capillaries. <clears throat> now the regulation of the aquaporins in the collecting ducts. Okay, so we said that the collecting duct, under normal circumstances, hides these aquaporins. 
meaning that under normal circumstances, water cannot be reabsorbed from the collecting ducts. Okay, so you see here these aquaporins, AQP, AQP2 means aquaporin um, re, uh, channels number two. Remember we said there are like about nine of these, so they are usually hidden unless vasopressin or ADH attaches to that receptor, to the ADH receptor, and activates the, increases the intracellular uh, C-AMP, and that is going to lead to the expression of these aquaporins onto the um, apical membrane. So normally, again, these are hidden unless ADH stimulates the ADH receptor, and that leads to these aquaporins now being expressed on the apical membrane. That is going to increase the reabsorption of water from the tubules into the capillaries. So making diluted urine or concentrated urine kind of ties into the effect of ADH. Um, so urine becomes diluted if it moves up. Um, so in the absence of ADH, so if ADH is low, okay, the collecting duct is not permeable to water. Okay, it'll allow all of that water to pass through um, the um, the filtrate will remain in the filtrate and that is going to lead to diluted urine or hypoosmotic urine. Now, if you need to concentrate the urine, you can do that by, again, stimulating the secretion of ADH from the posterior pituitary that is going to help in the reabsorption of water and now we are going to concentrate or making make hyperosmotic urine. So here shows you, I actually took this image from um, a different class. Okay, so here, this is in the absence of ADH. So the water is going to pass through the, the collecting ducts and just lead to the making of diluted urine. While in the presence of ADH, again, now we want to keep that water and we want to concentrate the urine. That is going to um, ADH will come in, we are now opening these aquaporins and water is being reabsorbed and we are concentrating the urine. Now the hyperosmotic medullary interstitium. So remember we kind of mentioned that once at the very beginning of the chapter where the interstitial tissue in the medulla needs to be hyperosmotic at all times. So there are a couple of factors that help um, that happening. So there's the countercurrent anatomy of the loop of Henle, meaning there's a descending limb and then an ascending limb. Um, the ascending limb allows for the passage of ions, but is um, impermeable to water, while the well, that's what I was talking about right now. So the ascending limbs can allow the passage of sodium and chloride or any other ions, but it does not allow the passage of water, while the descending limb is the exact opposite. The descending limb is permeable to water, but impermeable to ions. Okay, and there's also, um, we recycle the urea where the urea is trapped in the medulla, and that also helps in the uh, making the interstitium of the medulla, making it hyperosmotic. So we'll see how this happens. Okay, kind of you know looking at this image. So as the fluid, the, the filtrate goes down, the nephron, and then up here, this is where again in the ascending limb, ions are. The, it is permeable to ions only. So sodium chloride is going to be um, reabsorbed into the interstitium. Okay, but again, it is impermeable to water. So this interstitium now has higher concentrations of salt without water. So this interstitium is now hyperosmotic. It is that hyperosmolality that in this area that is going to pull water from the descending limb. Remember the descending limb is permeable to water only. Okay, and that countercurrent, you know, the current going down and then back up is why we call it the countercurrent multiplier. Okay, so you can see here, you know, the whole process occurring where in the ascending limb, 
permeable to ions, but not water. So the ions are going to be, will go out into this interstitium area, which now becomes hyperosmotic. And that is going to pull water from the descending limb, which again, the descending limb is permeable to water only, but not ions. There's also the process of urea recycling, which we'll talk about you know, kind of later in the chapter, but the, um, the presence of urea in this area also helps in the hyperosmolality of that area. So what happens to the osmolality of the filtrate as it passes through the nephron? Okay, so when it's filtered, okay, and it passes through the distal, sorry, the proximal convoluted tubules, the proximal tubules are permeable to both sodium and water, okay? So you end up having isotonic fluid. That isotonic fluid goes through the descending limb. Remember, the descending limb allows for the reabsorption of water only. So at the end of that limb, you end up having hypertonic fluid in the filtrate. Now that hypertonic filtrate goes through the ascending limb that allows the passage or the reabsorption of ions only. So at the end of the ascending limb, you end up having hypotonic filtrate. That hypotonic filtrate will go through the distal tubules and then into the um, collecting ducts. Again, you are going to change the um, how much water you'll keep in that filtrate depending on the needs of the body um, using the different levels or changing the levels of ADH. Now here's the urea cycling that I was talking about. So um, you can see here that part of urea, all of these red lines really represent urea recycling. So you see that part of it is reabsorbed, um, reabsorbed here as well. And then down here before it reaches the, um, through the collecting ducts and that reabsorption. So now all of that urea that is found in the interstitium or the interstitial space of the medulla helps creating the um, hyperosmolality that is found in this area. Now, a little summary on the renin-angiotensin system, and I believe we kind of talked about this already several times, but we'll go over that again. The angiotensinogen is an inactive protein that is made by the liver. <clears throat> when the kidneys are stimulated, when there is a decrease in blood pressure, that is going to stimulate the juxtaglomerular cells to make renin. Now, renin is an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 then needs to be activated in a second step um, through this ACE enzyme or angiotensin converting enzyme. And it changes from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 has a couple of effects. So it'll lead to vasoconstriction and it will also reach the kidneys and stimulate the adrenal cortex to make aldosterone. Aldosterone is a hormone that increases sodium and water retention, meaning that we are going to keep salt and water in our blood, in our bodies. Um, together with the vasoconstriction that happened, that is going to increase the blood pressure or bring the blood pressure up back to normal. Now, what a what happens with this whole vasopressin or the ADH regulation? So when there is a decrease in plasma volume, okay, remember that the there are baroreceptors that are found. Um, decreased plasma volume is going to decrease pressure in the venous atrial and in the arteries. That is going to stimulate um, cardiovascular baroreceptors, and that will, through a reflex, will stimulate or increase the secretion of ADH from the posterior pituitary. Now that ADH um, comes out, it will circulate through the plasma and reach the kidneys. In the kidney tubules or the collecting ducts, it is going to increase the tubular permeability to water by, again, increasing the um, expression of those aquaporins that will increase your water reabsorption and we are going to be making more concentrated urine. So we will keep that water in the body, hopefully to um, bring back that plasma volume up back to normal. 
So what about the effect of these osmoreceptors? Well, if somebody drinks in too much water, okay, that is going to decrease the body fluid osmolarity. That is, um, you know, leads to, that will be picked up by the osmoreceptors of the hypothalamus, leading to the decrease in vasopressin secretion by the posterior pituitary. Now, when that happens, um, vasopressin is now low, not enough of it is reaching the collecting tubules, and that will lead to the decrease in tubular permeability. So all of those aquaporins are going to be um, hidden. That will eventually lead to the decrease in water reabsorption and leading to an increase in water excretion. So we are going to now be making um, diluted urine. Atrial natriuretic peptide is a hormone that is a peptide hormone. It is made by the atrium of the heart, and it the name tells you what it does, okay? It throws sodium into urine, so it increases sodium excretion. When there's an increased plasma volume, that distends the atria of the hearts, and that stimulates those stretch receptors and leads to the increase of the secretion of AMP. AMP reaches the kidneys, and it will dilate the afferent arterioles while it constricts the efferent arterioles, so that increases the GFR. While the effect of AMP on the tubules is that it decreases sodium reabsorption, okay? Um, it performs that function either directly or indirectly by decreasing the plasma levels of aldosterone. All of these functions or all of these actions together will eventually increase sodium excretion. So you are dumping more sodium in urine and you are getting rid of it. Hence the name atrial natriuretic peptide. Now, what does hyperkalemia do? Okay, potassium is a very important ion, but it's also toxic. Okay, toxic especially to the heart, to the cardiac muscles. So any increase in potassium intake Okay, leading to hyperkalemia is going to stimulate the adrenal cortex to make aldosterone. So the main stimulus for aldosterone is high potassium levels. When aldosterone is high, that will lead to increased potassium secretion by the cortical collecting ducts. And that means that you are going to be excreting more potassium, dumping more potassium into urine, into the urine, and into the filtrate, which will eventually be um, excreted as urine. Now for the regulation of calcium and phosphates, well, those are by parathyroid hormones. Calcium reabsorption though in the proximal tubules is really not regulated. The whole effect of parathyroid hormone on calcium is through um, distal tubules and the cortical collecting duct. But PTH does have an effect on plasma reabsorption in the proximal tubules of phosphate. Now, the homeostatic control of pH. So we said that pH control or homeostasis is um, a shared function between the renal and the respiratory system. Okay, the respiratory system, the response of it is much faster because you can either hyperventilate or slow down breathing rates. So it, is, it takes about minutes to kick in while the response by the kidneys is a much slower response. It could take hours up to days until uh, it could help in uh, keeping that balance. Okay. If the cause, if the initial cause of the hydrogen imbalance is the respiratory system, then the kidneys have to correct it, while the opposite is true. So if the major cause is due to something else besides the respiratory, um, the respiratory can help in doing it, in correcting it. So we'll see what are the different uh, disorders. So respiratory acidosis means the accumulation of acid due to a respiratory cause. So for example, if somebody has pneumonia, okay, pneumonia you have, um, it is harder to exchange gases in pneumonia, in pneumonic patients. So these patients are going to have an accumulation of carbon dioxide, okay, um, and in order to compensate for those high levels of carbon dioxide to maintain a balance, there is going to be a renal compensation by increasing the levels of bicarbonate. 
Okay, so your primary abnormality is really the accumulation of carbon dioxide. Um, in respiratory alkalosis, so you want to think of this as somebody that is washing off a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of CO2. So for example, in hyperventilation, um, the, there is a decrease in CO2 levels. Okay, th that leads to the increase of hydrogen ions. So if you're not sure how that worked, remember the CO2 plus water leads, leads to carbonic acid that eventually breaks down to hydrogen and bicarb. So that's the relationship between you know, how these two are always working together in respiratory diseases. So a decrease in levels of CO2 leads to low hydrogen ions. And in, for, in order for the renal to comp, the kidneys to compensate for that, it is going to start, it'll also lead to the decrease in levels of bicarb. For metabolic acidosis, that means the patient is in a case of acidosis, but due to a metabolic cause, for example, diabetes. And basically, anything that can lead to acidosis besides a respiratory disease, okay? So we'll take, for example, that um, diabetic patient or somebody that has severe diarrhea. So diarrhea for a very long period of time where they're losing a lot of intestinal content. Remember that intestinal fluid is mainly alkalinic, so they are losing a lot of that alkalinic fluid and they are their body gets into a state of metabolic acidosis. So the um, primary abnormality is the loss of bicarbonate. And in order to compensate, okay, there is a, um, the um, respiratory system has to kick in. Okay, and that where now the body wants to get rid of all of that excess acid. In order to do so, it starts, the patient starts hyperventilating. So that is the reflex ventilator compensation, which would be the hyperventilation that happens in order to get rid of that um, imbalance. In metabolic alkalosis, that could be, for example, somebody that is vomiting um, all of that hydrochloric acid. So they have lost lots of acid and they now have relatively higher levels of bicarbonate. So that is your primary abnormality. And as a reflex, these patients are going to hypoventilate. Okay? And in order to um, compensate for all that loss of acid. Now, a couple of things on kidney diseases that many diseases affect the kidney, for example, bacterial infections, um, hypertension, and diabetes. End stage renal disease is one of the leading causes of death uh, worldwide and is the leading cause of renal transplants. This is a simplified diagram of what happens in a hemodialysis. So hemodialysis would be used in end-stage chronic renal failure where the patient's kidneys have lost the uh, ability to, do, to uh, filter all of the um, waste products from the body. So this kind of acts like that filter. So this right here is the filtering process, but there's a lot of other things that have to be used. So first off, you'll get, you know, obviously the blood has to pass through it. So you'll, the patient will have an IV, or actually it's in the artery, and there's a pump in order to pump the blood through these filters. But to prevent the blood from clotting, you have to add an anticoagulant. Sorry. And then through this filter, there is a dialysis fluid. Okay, so you'll push that dialysis fluid through a dialysis pump, and you want to make sure um, that everything that you have to get, gather all of the dialysis fluid that has now all of the waste products and drain it. And then the remaining of the blood that now has been filtered has to go through an air trap to trap any air bubbles. And you want to make sure that it is warmed up, okay? It's not too cold um, before it enters the patient's body. And you'll enter the patient's body through venous blood returned to the patient. Okay, so that is just kind of, um, you know, very simply how a hemodialysis unit works. There are two different ways of hemodialysis. So the one that we talked about is the through the blood um, vessels. And this is done as an outpatient 
where the patient comes in. Um, it cannot be done at home. Obviously, they have to be in a um, healthcare facility. It takes a couple of hours and then the patient is left to go home. Okay, not everybody has the ability to do that. Okay, some, pa some patients are maybe busier than others. Um, maybe they would prefer something more private. So there is another kind of dialysis known as peritoneal dialysis. In a peritoneal dialysis, you're using the peritoneal cavity as the filtering membrane. And the dialysis fluid is dumped into the peritoneal cavity. And then there is a drainage, a catheter that is attached where the drainage bag um, is now collecting that peritoneal fluid with all of the waste products. This is something though that the patient would have to be trained on doing at home, maybe getting a nurse to do it, um, you know, something that is attached to them. So you wanna give your patients different options. Sometimes depending on the clinical picture, some are candidates um, for one and not a candidate for the other, but you just need to understand how both of these work. And that term is the end of this chapter.